The Romans are known to be one of the bravest fighters that history has ever produced. Their determination, tactics, and grit made them incredibly skilled warriors. But that isn't to say that they never feared anyone out there. Throughout the major part of the 3rd century, Rome was engaged in the Second Punic War, considered one of the deadliest in Roman history. Why? Because history has written it down as the greatest danger the Romans faced. Although the Romans saw this war just at the end, one man in particular gave them sleepless nights. This is the story of Hannibal Barca, the man who almost brought the Romans to their knees. The contempt against the Romans was fueled inside Hannibal from a young age. His father, a general Hannibal, took Hannibal to a temple in Carthage, modern-day Tunisia, where he made him swear an oath of lifelong hostility towards Rome. That was too much bitterness for a child to experience at a young age. However, Hannibal was no ordinary child. He showed great military experience from a young age, and as the years rolled by, his hate for Romans only seemed to grow. A nine-year-old child had made it his life's mission to bring down the Romans and restore Carthage to its eternal glory. But that wasn't as easy as it seemed. Hannibal would not see his homeland for years after leaving with his father for the battlefield. All he knew at his young age were military camps. Before you knew it, he was already leading his own set of troops at 18. Eight years later, he was the commander of all the Carthaginian forces in the Iberian Peninsula. During this time, his father and brother had passed away, and all he had on his sleeve were years of military experience and expertise, which he had learned from the two men. And quite clearly, Hannibal did not disappoint. He gained immediate control in Spain, establishing the coastal city of Cartagena as his family's headquarters, where military and economic powers were the strongest. This further steamrolled into the expansion of Barsid influence in the Iberian Peninsula. As expected, Rome was the usual suspect worried about Hannibal's rise. Rome immediately showed action and allied with the city of Saguntum to have someone on their side when the time came to fight against Hannibal. Hannibal, however, did not welcome this alliance. According to a treaty that materialized earlier, the Ebro River was set as the boundary between the Roman and Carthaginian regions. Romans occupying Saguntum was considered a breach of the treaty, as per Hannibal. In 219 BCE, Hannibal laid siege to Saguntum and eventually captured it. These events led to the beginning of the Second Punic War. Even before the war began, Hannibal was well informed about his army's unfavorable situation. The naval superiority of the Romans prevented a direct attack from the sea, while the Roman legions massively outnumbered his army on the battlefield. Of course, a different leader would have opted for a more defensive strategy. But Hannibal wasn't your average leader. As a military genius, Hannibal would immediately attack from the front and take the fight to Rome, right in the heart of Italy. In 218 BCE, Hannibal's army crossed the Ebro River and moved north. It was a difficult journey, but Hannibal made some friends along the way. Hannibal entered southern Gaul with 40,000 men, 12,000 horsemen, and 38 war elephants. A deal was struck with the Gauls, and they allowed Hannibal and his men to cross the Rhone, modern-day river flowing through Switzerland and France, before the Romans could have the upper hand on him. As we said, Hannibal possessed two main qualities of being a brilliant commander and an intelligent strategist. Therefore, in October of the same year, Hannibal and his army reached the foothills of the Alps. The Romans immediately knew that the enemy had narrowly escaped their clutches. Although they weren't happy to hear this news, it resulted in their retreat. They headed back home to prepare for a war that was due in spring. During this time, the Alps were at the worst time of the year, and nobody would be crazy enough to cross them with a fleet as large as the Carthaginians. 
Unfortunately for the Romans, Hannibal was as crazy as they came. What some war generals could only dream of, Hannibal went on and executed those feats. Before crossing the Alps, his army abandoned all their siege engines and parts of the supply train to cross them easily. The army had to survive a difficult period of winter, which came with blizzards, avalanches and freezing temperatures. Food was scarce, and some soldiers even considered mutiny. To make matters worse, the army was attacked by surrounding tribes who settled in the mountains. But despite having the odds stacked against his men, Hannibal and his army came out victorious in this battle with nature. They exited the mountainous region through the Po Valley and entered Italy, the region of their foe. The Alps were crossed, and Hannibal entered Italy with his army. But that wasn't without its repercussions. He lost almost all his elephants, and whatever remained of his army wasn't a condition that could be deemed good enough for war. But as luck would have it, Hannibal's army wasn't short of allies. The local tribes revolted against the Romans, allowing Hannibal to enter the picture and prepare his army for battle. They replenished themselves and got much needed rest to attack the Romans from the front. As expected, the Romans were caught off guard. They were in complete disarray when they saw the Carthaginians on their toes, ready for battle. The Romans immediately sent General Scipio to intercept Hannibal and his men. Scipio and Hannibal and their respective armies battled each other at the Ticinus River in 218 BCE. And a rested army under the leadership of Hannibal was unforgiving and decisive. They sent the Roman army packing, and Scipio was severely wounded. This would be considered Hannibal's first major triumph in Italy, but it was just the beginning for him. Although Ticinus was a significant victory for the Carthaginians, it was simply a hint of bigger things for Hannibal and his army. Only a month after the events of Ticinus, there was an even more significant victory at Trebia. Several Romans were killed as they fled for their lives, and many more drowned in the rivers nearby due to freezing temperatures. Hannibal's victory at Trebia was a massive success as news spread quickly amongst the locals who hopped on Hannibal's cause to lay siege to Rome. The casualties of the Roman army at Ticinus are believed to be somewhere between the figures of 20 to 30,000. Hannibal's army, meanwhile, only had a few thousand deaths, so the tide was very much in favor of the Carthaginian commander. The following year in 217 BCE, the Romans were caught off guard again. The Romans thought they had prepared better this time than Ticinus and Trebia. They blocked two of the main routes through the Apennines leading south. Hannibal then led his army through the Arno Valley, a marshland considered impossible to pass. Once again the elements of nature intervened and brought significant loss to Hannibal's army. Several of his soldiers drowned in marshes and died due to infection. Even Hannibal himself lost vision in one of his eyes. That is how difficult getting past the Arno Valley was. But with this hardship, Hannibal and his men had a victory shortly. Further ahead, at Lake Trasimene, Hannibal delivered a devastating blow to the Romans, where he carried out a vast ambush. It was considered one of the most successful military ambushes in history. The Romans lost large numbers in it. 15,000 Romans were killed, and an equal number were taken prisoners of war. The path to Rome was as open as ever, and Hannibal knew that he had to strike while the iron was still hot. The Romans had failed to get the better of Hannibal on many occasions. Not only did it show Hannibal's military expertise, but it showed that no matter how much planning the Romans had of their own, Hannibal would almost always outsmart them. Since this situation was getting out of hand, the Romans knew they had to devise a solution quickly. With Rome badly bruised from Lake Trasimene, Hannibal knew that his next move would probably be the most important one in the Siege of Rome. As for the Romans, all these setbacks only made them more stubborn 
and they were in no mood to surrender. Quintus Fabius Maximus was appointed as a dictator by the Senate to save Rome and Italy as a whole. Maximus was a general who believed in beating the enemy off the battlefield. Instead of attacking the enemy from the front, he believed in eliminating resources that would help his enemies. Maximus was focused on removing the vital provisions that Hannibal's army could use. As good as this strategy was, the Senate demanded more results quicker. It wanted a quicker victory because time was not on its side. In the south of Italy, aristocrats were looted by Hannibal's forces in large numbers, which was another reason why the Romans wanted to bring down the curtains of the Second Punic War. The Romans were running out of patience, and the only goal they had in sight was to get rid of Hannibal and the Carthaginians for good. The Roman leaders had enough of Maximus's tactics and called for a leadership change. And this time, two newly appointed consuls entered the mix, Aemilius Paulus and Terentius Varro. These two were given an army of 80,000 men to handle one not-so-simple task, stopping Hannibal Barca. Hannibal was ready for what was coming. He knew the Romans would come in all guns blazing, and to get them to attack first, he went to Cannae and captured an important supply zone. Cannae was near the Adriatic coast. The two armies locked horns in 216 BCE. Varro commanded the army on this day, and he packed his soldiers in such a formation that he would attack Hannibal's soldiers in the center of their formation. Hannibal had predicted this move, so in the line's central part he placed a quick-moving infantry and heavy infantry on the positioning flanks. It was such a genius war tactic that military academies teach even today. As the Romans moved forward, Hannibal's infantry withdrew, and the flanks stood their guard. In moments, Hannibal's line ended up taking on a crescent formation, which allowed the legionaries to take their chance from the center. The Romans were unaware of the treacherous trap that awaited them. The enemy cunningly surrounded thousands of Roman soldiers, leaving them no room to move. Hannibal's cavalry dealt the final blow as Roman horse riders were driven away, and by sundown, there was nothing left of the Romans. It was a devastating victory for Hannibal and his army. The Romans were caught off guard. Before they knew it, it was too late. The Roman army had been completely wiped out when night fell, leaving nothing but destruction. One consul, Aemilius Paulus, was killed during the fight while several others ended up fleeing the battlefield. This defeat was the most crushing in Rome's history, whether as an empire or a republic. But only a few people predicted that from then on, Hannibal would lose what he had. His grip, which he had established in Cannae, would soon make him and his army complacent, and this complacency would lead to defeat in the bigger picture. Nobody could have predicted that in the events to come, the Carthaginians would fall into the pit of defeat. The current period was the pinnacle of Hannibal's military career, but several problems also came with it. Rome was the weakest it had ever been, and its world-famous army was nowhere to be seen. Successive defeats saw their best army generals swept away by Hannibal, as it seemed very likely that he would soon take over all of Italy. The Republic was in shambles and eventually fell out of control. Even in such a strong position, Hannibal never opted for war as the first option, like any sensible war general. He proceeded to negotiate terms of peace with the Senate, but the Senate rejected them completely. The move was incredibly risky, and after Cannae, chaos was widespread in Rome. It seemed as if Hannibal was waiting outside the gates and that he would attack at any given instant. Such were the fears of the Romans. They repaired the fortifications and expected Hannibal's massive army to strike them immediately. And the wait for Hannibal to strike Rome went on forever because he never arrived. Why Hannibal this happened is still unknown. Did he believe that peace could still be an option? We do not know. Hannibal's men were serial winners who won back-to-back -back battles but were exhausted. They needed rest to recharge because they still had a long journey ahead. And considering how fortified Rome was, an army needed to possess the right equipment for a siege to carry out successfully. At this point, Hannibal and his army were all on their own because Carthage was unwilling to send support of any kind. This is one of the reasons that contributed to the downfall of Hannibal's army. 
Support for Hannibal was withdrawn when he was on the cusp of conquering Rome. Instead of holding back and deciding the next course of action, Hannibal's brother, Hasdrubal, clashed with the Romans in the Battle of the Metaurus. But despite his best efforts, Hasdrubal suffered a crushing defeat, and his army was thrown into a disorganized retreat. Hasdrubal charged into battle in a last-ditch effort, knowing it would surely lead to his death. This was a massive blow to Hannibal, who was then forced to enlist inexperienced men in his army from the southern part of Italy. It was the first time between these two sides that Rome felt it had the upper hand. Publius Scipio, a survivor from Cannae, was given command of the Roman armies and sent overseas. In Italy, the Romans retreated to the tactics of Fabian and avoided engaging with Hannibal's army on the battlefield. Instead, a scorched earth tactic was applied, leaving the Carthaginians in even more disarray. Hannibal's undefeated record against the Romans is not important because he knew he was nearing a permanent end. All because he could not capitalize while the Romans were at their weakest. Unfortunately, Hannibal was helpless as he saw Scipio's legions drive the Carthaginians out of Spain. The Romans eventually took back their lands in Italy and moved from strength to strength as Hannibal's allies abandoned him for good. Scipio's trip overseas took him to Hannibal Barca's homeland, and Hannibal had to return to Carthage to face Scipio because they feared that the capital would fall. All the hardship, struggle and lands conquered seemed of little importance to Hannibal now, as it was clear that the Romans were on the brink of winning the Punic War. The final bit of this Punic War took place on the Zama Plains, in the previous quarter of 202 BCE. Hannibal Barca, like always, was leading a large army. The remaining help came from the Italian regions he conquered, as well as the 80 elephants that he had. This time Hannibal had anticipated what the Romans would do yet again, and he planned to use elephants to shock them. But now the enemy he faced had studied his strategy, and was well versed in countering it. As soon as the elephants made their way towards the Roman army, the Romans opened up large gaps between their men that allowed the charging elephants to pass through. Many of these elephants had lost their controllers, resulting in a stampede amongst the Carthaginian army, trampling the soldiers. Seeing an opening in the Roman army, Scipio immediately ordered his men to attack the horsemen, who were present on Hannibal's flanks, protecting him. The Carthaginian infantry was also attacked from behind, which resulted in a brilliant Roman victory. They had finally bested Hannibal Barca, and now was the time to put him down once and for all finally. Carthage was disillusioned and received a heavy knockout at the hands of the Romans. It renounced all that it had and wasn't allowed to take any sort of military action without the approval of Rome. Even after losing power in the region of Spain, Hannibal's influence in Carthage was incredible. His success was reflective of people's confidence in him. However, the Romans were not ready to let go of all the shame that they suffered at one man's hands. So instead of executing Hannibal, the public demanded he be extradited. The hero of Carthage was sent away from his homeland yet again, and this time there was no point in return. For a few years, Hannibal served as the chief military advisor at the court of Antiochus III, and his plan of hitting back at the Romans was wiped out when the Romans defeated Antiochus at the Battle of Magnesia in 189 BCE. Hannibal had fled after this war and was on the run. His last known military service was in the service of King Prusius I of Bithynia, who fought against the kingdom of Pergamon, an ally of the Romans. His last victory was when he defeated Pergamon's fleet. This caused the Romans to intervene and demand that Bithynia hand Hannibal over to them. They eventually complied, and Hannibal was all on his own at this point. But instead of being captured by the people he loathed all his life, he decided it was better to die with honor. Thus, the Supreme War General committed suicide by drinking poison at age 66. 
Hannibal Barker was one of the greatest war generals in history, ranking among the greatest names such as Julius Caesar and Napoleon Bonaparte. His string of victories isn't what made him the greatest, but because it was due to him, the Romans changed their military layout. Even after centuries, Hannibal Barker is known as the man who brought the great Romans to their feet. He was a man who Rome defeated, but his legend on the battlefield survives even to this day.